We are back. Uh, what a wonderful day we are having today. My gosh, amazing event. Um, the next talk is, as you probably guess, special for me. Um, he's Antonio Spin. He's one of the most talented researchers uh, in behavioral economics. He's an economical behaviorist and behavioral <laughs> economist. <laughs> economist. Uh, Antonio, how are you? Hello, Fran. I'm very good. I'm pleased to be here with uh, in the first Behavioral Economics Plus HR Summit. Uh, it's really a pleasure. Um, I think the, uh, I have to congratulate you because this event is really amazing. So I think we are a little bit, uh, so we, we don't have time. So if you don't mind, I will start because we talk uh, very often. So <laughs> let's start. Thank you very much. Let me first. Well, I hope everything is okay. So, as Fran said, I'm, I'm um, one of the co-founders of BH4. I'm the scientific director. I'm proud of it. And uh, my talk is, uh, is titled Behavioral Economics Assessment. And uh, I will give some, I cover some topics on it. And I will also offer an application to IIL teams, to, to teams working on their IIL methodology. Um, yeah, let me first introduce a little bit the company. These are the three founders. A little bit younger than two nowadays, but only three years younger, I think. So, Fran Reyes, you already know him very well. Jaime Martinez Brocal, and myself. Well, we are glad of, of being pioneers in applying behavioral economics assessment to human resources. Uh, we can say that very, um, we are very proud of it that we have, to the best of our knowledge, the first paper on the topic. And we published this paper in the Journal of Behavioral Economics for Policy in 2017. And it's entitled Organizations Should Know the People a Behavioral Economics Approach. Um, and my authors were Fran uh, and we see the psychologists uh, who, who were before with us. Okay, uh, this is our main framework. This is how we work. We apply this framework to all our projects. It's a very simple, I would say simplistic method, but if you don't follow these three steps, you probably will be doing something wrong. So first of all, we have to identify the issue, of course, what's the problem and what we should measure in order to solve this. Okay, then measurement, the aim of the main framework, framework is measurement. We start from the premise that there shouldn't be intervention without proper measurement. And what we do is that we have a data platform and people behavior and preference are measured in the platform online. So with this data, what do we do is analyzing the data and segmentation of the people. People are classified, consider the behavioral profiles. And then we analyze the relationship of these uh, uh, profiles of these behavioral variables with the KPI, so predictive analysis. And then, we can intervene. Once we have measured, we have analyzed, we know the origin of the problem, then we can intervene. And when we can design action strategies to improve satisfaction, engagement, performance, HR management, and so on. Okay, so very simple, but don't miss it. So the uh, our platform, our tool for the behavioral assessment is Behave for Diagnosis. Is, um, is a platform in which the people, employees, or whatever participant, we also use it for research, uh, for academic research. They just have to log in using Unix ID. And normally, we don't know the, the identity of the person. So the company that want to, to assess uh, employees, 
they assign them an ID, a random code or whatever, and we don't know anything about the person, just the, the, the ID. Then they enter uh, in the platform and then they play some economic games, okay, tasks. Well, we have a very large portfolio. We can measure many, many things. Uh, now, after a long development and many brainstorming, we have been able to, to, to create this map. And this map is, is, we have five dimensions, five behavioral dimensions. And each of the dimension has some behavioral variables, okay? And also, don't forget to say this, we have kind of express version, a pro version. The express version only includes some measures, and it takes between 15 and 20 minutes, and the pro version takes between 35 and 45 minutes. And the pro version includes all the measures. So um, the first dimension, for instance, I will not explain all of them because I don't have time. But uh, the first dimension is decision-making style. We measure risk aversion, risk neutrality, loss aversion, long-run orientation, and analytic thinking. In the second one, we measure MB. Remember yesterday in Pablo's talk about the power of MB. Uh, we measure MB, we measure compassion, which is basically the opposite of MB. Um, and then selfishness, egalitarianism, altruism, and social efficiency. These are called social preferences. Um, it's very common in the like, real world that people say, okay, use an adjective for like being kind. You are, this, this person is kind of, or is prosocial. But behavioral economics have defined very different or different types of prosociality. For instance, it's not the same being egalitarian, which is a type of prosociality that you want to reduce difference between the people. Uh, than being uh, altruistic, for instance. An altruistic person want to increase the, the, the reward of, or the benefit of the other person. And this is also not the same as social efficiency preference. People with preference for social efficiency, they want to maximize the whole group benefit, regardless of the within group distribution. Okay, so we have, and then imagine in the third uh, dimension, which is more related to what we say social behaviors, uh, we have cooperativeness, also related with Pablo's talk about uh, we use the public good game, basically. Conditional cooperation, trust, trustworthiness, coordination, a lot. So, in, uh, you know, the common wisdom sometimes is not able to differentiate it. But the, the definitions in behavioral economics are very strict, and we can differentiate between uh, generosity and fairness. It's not the same. No, trust and trustworthiness is not the same. Okay, and the fourth dimension is ambition and competitiveness. And uh, talks about competition with others or with oneself. And the last one is mind and reason. Okay, assessment of course are nothing new. And um, basically, you people in, in HR, you know a lot of this. Uh, employees assessment are very common in HR. Um, so one of the basic applications is to predict job performance. And this, we can, you can, we can talk about two old or more traditional methods. The oldest one, which is measuring cognitive abilities. So you hire smarter people, basically. Uh, it's a new method, a more new, newer method, used, been used in large companies, uh, in, like in the last one decade, uh, last decade or two decades, that's measuring personality traits, okay, in order to adapt the people. And basically, always, the, the procedure is the same. What you have to do is correlate the assessment results with the business KPIs, whatever performance indicator you want, key performance indicator you want to maximize or to reduce if, if it's a negative indicator. And this can be used for recruitment, of course, to place the correct people in the correct position, to fit the firm, to fit the team, or to fit the boss. Not that the fitting is not necessarily being identical to the people in the team, for instance, or to the boss. Probably the team, what you want 
is to increase diversity. You have a lot of risk averse people and then you want one risk loving people. This will be also fit in the team because you want exactly this combination. And retention and so on, many, many applications. We thought when we started with this uh, endeavor, this enterprise, uh, that behavioral economics can also complete the picture because uh, we have we have methods to, to measure the profiles of the people. So, uh, there are limitations. Uh, behavioral assessment has some strengths, or that, but also some weaknesses. And, and the limitations are basically common to all assessments, uh, all types of assessments. The participation problem. How mm, do you encourage people to participate? Okay, sometimes normally this is voluntary. Uh, it's difficult to like, to sanction people or to punish them if they don't participate. So I'm very related with this. If you are unable to to, to make all your employees to participate, um, then you have self selection issues. Imagine that you have you want to to see the correlation between cooperation and the KPI, and then you see please. Only the volunteers that want to participate, then and only you get only very cooperative people because are those willing to help the company. Then you know have variability to uh, to analyze the relationship between cooperation and the KPI if you only have highly highly cooperative people in the sample. So this is important. And the most important compared with lab experiments or online experiments for for academic research is that you feel observed by the boss. And this is strong, of course. This is a strong incentive. And the behavioral economics measures offer a number of advantages. Control. We can systematically assess preferences. For instance, uh, on risk, I will talk basically about these three types of preferences. Risk, time preferences, and social preferences. Uh, while keeping control over external factors. We can differentiate people based on formal models uh, because these definitions are based on mathematical models. You can differentiate, for instance, between risk averse and risk loving persons, impatient and patient people, egalitarian and selfish, for instance. But but not only this. We can we can say it's, it's not that only we can only say this person is egalitarian and this is also egalitarian, is that this person is weakly egalitarian and this person is strongly egalitarian. And this person is more strongly egalitarian than the other one. So we have different levels for for all the variables because the formal models that uh, are used to, to build them allow us. Real behavior. People uh, in behavioral economics measure make decisions in general with real consequences and normally about money. Uh, this is called incentive compatibility. And this is the only way or one very powerful way of getting the true preference of the people because they they can lose money if they don't choose what they, what they want or they can make the, the person they love lose money if they don't choose to be altruistic with them. So this is important. Comparability, because values are objective and based on formal models, the comparability is very good between people. So, because imagine that we ask, you ask someone in a level from one to seven, how altruistic you are, and she say six. Another person says five. Are we sure that the person saying six is more uh, altruistic or whatever than the person saying six, uh, five? or because they have different experience and they thought our behavioral economic me me uh, measures can compare people without these problems. So our workhorse, as I said, are economic games. We infer the preferences of individuals from their choices, not from what they state. Their choices then rebuild the preferences. We, we use the, the framework of rebuild preferences, not state. Economic games elicit underlying behavioral preference using abstract scenarios that avoid biased choices and go directly to ask about the origin of the choice. 
Uh, this is important because respondents can easily link the decision they make to specific situations because the scenarios are normally so abstract and so context-free that participant they don't cannot link this with their experience and then they, their response are less biased. Uh, as I said, uh, games require real incentives because otherwise participant decision would be just cheap talk and will fail to reveal their true preference or behaviors. And finally, compared to surf reports, behavioral assessment techniques are uh, less likely to be manipulated by the respondent because it's precisely of this, because they don't really know what we are measuring. In some cases, are more, it's more obvious, but in, some, in other cases, it's very difficult to find, to find out what we are measuring. Uh, well, what about how robust these measures are well they, so in economic games people make decisions over real monetary stakes for instance um let's see some some measures before entering in the robustness of that. um for instance to analyze risk preference risk aversion risk loving preference these are standard questions we ask people to make a decision for instance do you prefer $100 for sure, yes, 100% pro probability, or $200 with 50% probability, or zero with 0% zero with 50% probability. That means you can get 100 for sure or toss a coin, and then if the, if the outcome is tails, you get zero. If the outcome is uh, heads, you get 200. So someone who chooses to, to, to get the 100 for sure is more risk averse and someone who chooses the 200 in, with 50 probability. Uh, very similar for time preferences. We ask them, do you prefer receiving 100 today or 104 in one month? That basically means, are you willing to wait one month for $4 extra? A very impatient person will say, okay, come on, I will not wait for that shit amount of money, right? Uh, and then we'll choose the 100 today. And the uh, uh, more patient person will say, okay, it's not bad, one month, but it's four, four dollars more. Okay. Uh, social preference. Typical question. Would, what do you prefer to keep 200 euros for you? It's similar to a dictator game. Or, so normally these social preference uh, instructions start saying, okay, you will be randomly matched with another participant. This participant is anonymous for you. You will never learn who he or she is. And also, she, she will never learn who you are. Then, do you prefer to keep these 200 euros I give you or to share uh, 100 for you and 100 for your partner? OK, this can measure different social preference. This is one for, of course, someone who keeps the 200 seems to be a little more selfish than the other one. Okay, let's give, I don't know if I have time, but a very, very quick example of how really games measure preference. I would say even a little bit stupid sample, but, but let's try. Um, we have one participant here and we give her 200 now in euros. 200 and she has to make a decision which car she wants to buy. Okay, in the top part, I will focus first. We have a well-designed decision. And this, we will see a bad design task, basically a decision task. In a well-designed decision, the first stage, we have that car A and car B are identical, but for the wheels, because the wheels have different color. The car B is black wheels, car A is white wheels. But both cars are identical for other, other features, and the price is the same, 100. Then, if Marta chooses car B, we can infer that she prefers black wheels. Okay, but what if she, since they, they have the same price, she said, okay, I don't mind. She just chose car B randomly. Let's make her another question. Okay, now we increase the cost of car B. And now car B costs 110. If Marta still chooses Kabi, 
First, it validates her preference for, for black wheels. So she was not deciding randomly before. And fine tuning this uh, bill's price, we can measure exactly how much exactly Martha values black wheels. Okay, there's some point in which he said, okay, now, no, no, for 1,000, no, for 1,000, I prefer the, the white wheels. No? I mind similarly with the time preference here, the question here. What we do normally is not just one question. We have one task with a series of questions like this. And then, for instance, in the time in the time preference one, imagine that the person chooses the 100 today because she is not willing to wait for uh, for extra dollars. Then we say, okay, what if we offer you offer uh, 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 eight dollars instead of four? No, still I don't want. So we increase recursively the amount given in one month, and then at some point she switched because we offered a large amount. Then we can measure exactly how much she valued the present versus the future. Okay, this is, will be a well-designed decision. In a by design decision, for example, car A and car B are the same model, but car, both the car and the wheels have different color. Again, both cost the same. Well, what happens that we have two variables changing from one car to the other? The wheels and the color. Okay, this I see this a little bit stupid sample because probably you say, oh, well, the black combines better with, with the yellow color. Okay, but in general, we want to know how one variable affects the output. And then in this case, since there are two variables differing between the two, if Marta chooses car B, we cannot know whether she prefers what black wheels or just the yellow color. So this will be about the same decision making. Okay, let's continue with that. Of course, paying people is costly for, for, for the company or for the assessment company. Uh, but we tend to use probability rewards that have been proved valid in this paper and in more papers, uh, these uh, probability rewards have been used and, and they're able to elicit social preference that people make consider the decision. Probability rewards mean that not all the people receive the money and not from all the decisions. For example, only 10% of the people will receive the money, will be randomly selected to receive the money from one randomly selected decision. So we reduce the, the, the bill here, no? But still pe people may consider the decision because the money is there. We can nowadays use a smartphone apps for payments that personal data is protected. This is very important. So even for payments, we can remain uh, blind to the people, to, 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 to who they are. And what about robustness, uh, validity? Okay, um, in personality traits and cognitive skills, since there is a longer tradition, there, there is a lot of meta-analytic evidence showing the, prefer the relationship with KPIs and so on. Uh, but still, behavioral economics measures are starting now. There is no meta-analytic evidence, but there is a, a bunch of studies showing that these measures can predict out of lab behaviors. For instance, cooperation can predict uh, or cooperativeness in a public good game can predict uh, cooperation when fishing. Uh, we know also that people who are more patient are more likely to save versus consume or are less likely to, to use credit cards. So it seems they are valid for predict, predicting out of lab behavior. And in terms of uh, reliability or test retest stability, what is technically called test retest stability, this measure are very, very stable in the range of personality traits. So someone who is impatient today is also impatient uh, in one year. So people do not uh, behave very differently when they are assessed in different moments of time. Well, this is what our platform uh, releases, how the platform releases the, the reports. All the measures that are obtained are shown in a in bars like this, and this can be uh, observed or seen by the manager, but also by us, of course. 
uh, if the manager wants, uh, can be also seen by the by the, the participant if the manager allows that. Okay, and basically what we show is the difference between the score or the participants in terms of standard deviations from the average. Okay, in order to have a very standardized measure, 100 means one, one standard deviation. Uh, from the average, and the average is based in a benchmark group, a representative population of between 1,000 and 7,000 people. This is not really important, what's the population? It's a pseudo-representative population. But the important is to have the same benchmark for everyone. And also we offer the company the option to add another benchmark comparison group. In this case, they can, they can choose, for instance, the company mean, or, or the mean of all the logis, I want to see the mean of all my employees in the in the report, okay? they are. or I want to see the mean in the industry, or I want to see the my my score there in order to compare my people with myself. Okay, so this person, for instance, is above the average. It's important to note that in general, in our measures, being below or above the average is not bad or good. So you sometimes need. Uh, risk loving people, one below average risk aversion, or you need for other tasks, you need risk averse people. And the same, sometimes you need impatient people, sometimes you need patient people. Okay, and this is basically what you see when you download the report or when you, you see the report on the platform. For each person, the score and the difference with average. Okay, some applications, of course, comparing the characteristics of groups within the organization by departments, by locations, management levels, teams, basically, know your people. I'm taking advantage, I couldn't stop myself from adding this, taking advantage of Jaromir Kovarik's talk, uh, you can also analyze the organization social network. And in, uh, our platform also has a, a tool to analyze this. We ask people with whom they want to accomplish a task, and so on, and these standard measures. And we can see who is more central, more betweenness, who, who is more close to cluster to each other. Okay, we can get the map, and with these two things, you know your people and now your their relationships. And these are very important. And by the way, as uh, Frank, I think, mentioned before, we did a network analysis of our friends on the HR community on Twitter only for a weekend. And uh, and, and, and we uh, made a post in our blog, so I recommend you to, to go to the blog to, to see it. And we can find here some of our friends. Uh, I will mention Joanna, who will talk just in, in some in a half hour, uh, with the ripples over here. Okay, I will not stop more. Let me give you an example. Imagine that firm X implemented a new compensation scheme for the for the sales force. And, and the scheme was a bonus, um, a monthly tournament, a monthly contest, in which the, the person with the top sales numbers will get, in the last month, will get $200 in this case. They implemented this. After some time, the, on average, they didn't, didn't see any change in results. They, they didn't increase. So on average, there were no more sales. Their expectations fail. They say, come on, we are spending much more money because they are paying the bonus, but sales are not increasing. Why? There is no performance improvement. And then what we have for will do, and this is always the, nearly always the same methodology. We measure something. We measure, in this case, risk, time, and social preference for salesmen, saleswomen. And because even you don't find an increase in average, they are very likely like heterogeneous effects. Some people reduce their performance or do not increase it. Some people could be increasing it. So we want to know who is increasing and who is decreasing the performance. And then correlate the um, assessment results with the KPI. So measure analysis. The KPI in this case is, is very clear. Sales after the intervention and after the introduction of the bonus minus sales before the introduction of the bonus. The, this kind of KPI can be 
can be used for, for, for anything. For instance, it's very useful nowadays to see uh, performance after being working remotely minus performance before being working remotely. Okay. Then, identifying the origin of the problem to solve it, what we want to do is to solve it through in incentive architecture. We have also people architecture. We, I will talk about incentive architecture. So, if we observe that KPI is worse among more risk averse people, this is what our analysis says, then we can understand that the incentive is probably too volatile, okay, too risky. Solution increase the probability that someone gets incentive, reduce the incentive rather than 100 for one person, 20, uh, sorry, 200 for one person, 20 uh, for 10 person. Okay, so you are reduced, you are increasing the probability, and, and risk averse people are more motivated for it. But now imagine that rather than risk aversion, the variable that predicts this is impatient, it's long run or impatient. So if Impatient people are um, getting worse KPIs, probably the incentive is too delayed and they are not motivated. Come on, one year ahead, I had, I'm not motivated about uh, one month ahead uh, bonus, sorry. Solution, make realization close in time, okay? Rather than 200 a month, uh, 50 every week. Uh, imagine we find that these egalitarian people uh, would, uh, would have reduced their performance. Probably the, the incentive is too unequal. The solution would be to make the incentive more unequal. For instance, for all the team, if they increase their, their sales, they, they get a small amount, for, but for everyone. But now that without making our analysis, we could not infer whether the incentive was too delayed. Because this is very common. Oh, you cannot use one year ahead incentives because this do not motivate people. Yeah, sometimes it is able to motivate people. So why spend a little bit more time to, to create a more complex bonus if this is not the problem? The problem, you have to find it using an analysis, uh, a, a proper analysis. Okay, and let me, I have uh, seven or eight minutes more. Um, let me enter into the, the last case. It's a, this is a real case example. A real application to agile teams in the IT sector. Um, well, very briefly, um, now it's very common that people, or, um, yeah, companies working in, in IT and software development and so on, uh, use the agile methodology. And this basically means that the people in the company are organizing teams called squads. And these are kind of autonomous teams with an entrepreneurial mindset. Okay? There is better knowledge sharing low risk aversion, so uh, this is um, self, very similar to what Perry Teams was, uh, was talking about, self-managed teams. Okay, and the company, the project was, I want to know which behavioral preferences can predict in performance. Okay, we, they gave us a KPI, what's slightly different between different units uh, or departments, uh, but we standardized them using uh, the use of methodology. So we get one KPI for everyone that is comparable across units and across teams. These were software development R&D departments in an European work center with more than uh, 1,700 1, employees organized in 97 semi-autonomous squads of between 10 and 20 people. With this information, the company, with information from our project, of course, the company HR leaders can make better data-driven decisions about how performance-based incentives should be defined and how people should be relocated into teams in order to maximize performance. Okay, we obtained from them a kind of 30 behaviors or something like that, 30 measures, but the HR leaders were interested in this. I don't know, they are seven, uh, 12 or something like that, or 13. Because probably they didn't understand much well the other definitions, or that's because they were interested in this. Okay, cognitive skill, cognitive thinking, you can see them. And a brief definition of each one. 
in the non-social domain on the left and the, on the social domain on the right. And we ask them, the HR leaders, what do you think, we made a survey amongst them, uh, what do you think uh, a squad should have in order to excel, to, to be a top performing uh, squad? And then they say, okay, we think, and um, note these two, these are very important because they thought that they should be very patient, very long run oriented, and they thought they should be very cooperative. Also, they thought they should be non risk averse, non loss averse, and non envious. Okay? Of course, they also wanted them to, to, to be smart, to, to be analytic, but not that strong. And um, basically, they were indifferent towards social efficiency, negative reciprocity, altruistic payment. So HR leaders had clear that they want patient people, or they thought that, that a, a good squad would be made for, uh, by, formed by patient people and cooperative people. Non-risk averse, non-loss averse, and non -end. We did an assessment and first problem, a total of 425 employees belonging to 63 squads participated in the, in the online assessment using the, the diagnosis platform. As you can see, the participation was rather low, 25%. Only five squads have all their members assessed. This limits a lot the scope of the analysis. The reasons underlying the low participation rate are multiple, but essentially related to an unexpectedly high workload at the time. Remember the participation problem. You always have something that is a perfect excuse not to do the assessment. Okay, we prevented performing like a more powerful statistical analysis that was the initial idea or like the first, uh, the first best. Uh, that was based on finding out which particular combination of behavioral profiles in a squad leads to the highest performance, okay? And then, uh, rather than the combination, we uh, had to, to, to stay uh, to, in the second best. That was limiting our study to uncovering the measures because the, the, the participation was low. We cannot do this combination, right? If we have only three person assessed in a in a twenty person squad, you cannot this combination stuff. But uh, we can do average. And then what we did is that uh, we averaged uh, across squad members each variable, and then see what of this average predicting performance. And of course, a squad with high participation rate had more weight on the, on the estimation statistical analysis. What do we found? We found two variables. We made, we put everything in the cocktail and shake that. And what we found is that patient, a squad with more patient members display high KPIs. Here in the, you have long run orientation, patients, also in the, in the same scale as before. And here the standard is KPI, okay? The small size circles are squads in which the participation rate was very small and they are not so important in the estimation. And the large uh, circles are squads in which almost everyone is uh, participating. We have data. So the variance explained was 10% and was significant at the 99% significant level, confidence level. Operativeness, based on the public good game, was also very similar, a little bit weaker, weaker, but the squads with more cooperative, on average, members display higher KPIs. The variance is playing in this case is 6%, and this is significant than the 95% confidence level. And with these two variables, what we did is to create an algorithm giving the exact weight to long run orientation and cooperativeness on the algorithm. So a squad with more long run oriented and more cooperative members displays higher KPIs. We have here the prediction with the algorithm. And the prediction with the algorithm explains basically the sum of the of the other two. So 16% has, and is very significant. No, it's significant of the 19 99.8%. I'm almost done. So what were the recommendations from from behave for from the results? 
In terms of people architecture, sorry, first allocate more long run oriented and cooperative individuals into high priority squads, but always using the algorithm. Why? Because long run orientation and cooperation are not equally important. So you have to use exact ways uh, that the algorithm says. Of course, hire those candidates with the high long run orientation and cooperativeness. This is obvious. What about incentive and environment architecture? One is reduce the delay between performance and performance based bonuses. We didn't know that, but they have a performance bonus that is realized, uh, realized the, the next year. So the performance is today and in one year I receive the money. This for sure does not motivate so long oriented impatient people. Then we suggest to distribute the bonuses quarterly, reduce them by one quarter, and then uh, instead of yearly, to motivate these people to, to perform. Uh, also, create a more cooperative environment with elements that increase the perceived cooperative of other employees. Because we also found that people were not, they distrust a little bit on the cooperative, no, cooperativeness of their partners, of the other people in the company. So, uh, since the people are tend to be conditional cooperators, they uh, didn't cooperate that much because they thought the other were not cooperating. And uh, also, if you remember from yesterday, uh, Erika Rascon's uh, talk, whenever possible, in this case, we recommend evaluating the effectiveness of the solution using A-B testing or randomized control trial. That means applying these interventions only to one sector to randomly selection fraction of the, of the squads in this case, intervention units. And this is the, the treatment group. And then you keep a control group without intervention. Analyze how much the KPA differ between treatment and, and control groups after, let's say, one year. And only if the evaluation gives the satisfactory results, intervention should be extended to the whole organization. This would be the perfect procedure. Okay, just to finish, some conclusions, some take homes. Uh, public and private organization are increasingly applying behavioral economics methods to a variety of uses of issues, mechanical design, scientific architecture, and, and more, but not so much, or at least the area of behavioral economic uh, assessments remains understudied. Behavior is very proud of being pioneer in this area. Uh, we start from the premise that there shouldn't be intervention on HR processes and any other process without measuring first how people behave. The economic gains are powerful instrument to complement. This is very important to complement cognitive and personality assessments. Behavioral traits measured with economic gains can predict job performance at both individual and the team level. And this information is key to understand its underlying processes. The origin of the problem is not just, OK, I know that long run orientation. No, it means that probably the incentives is to delay. No, so this, this point is important. Uh, I mean, we hope that organization will increasingly use behavioral economics assessment to improve the knowledge of their people, the year performance, satisfaction, and well-being. So thank you very, very much. Hello. Uh, as you can guess, uh, you know, this talk is, is, is amazing. Uh, thank you, Antonio, for, for pointing uh, for point out all the advantages that behavioral economics assessment uh, have uh, to be applied in, in, in organizations. Well, if you, if you agree, let's go with some questions. Um, Pablo uh, asked, what is the alternative if the company doesn't want to pay money incentives to participants, workers? Yeah, this is a very good question, and Pablo knows a lot about this because uh, I already, because Pablo is one of our advisors, and then uh, we were discussing this uh, uh, some time ago. Um, we, 
uh, I think Paula's idea at that time was to use time, uh, like leisure time, or you can, it, rather than 100 uh, euros, you can get 100 minutes of leisure time. And, and this is not to, just to be kind to Pablo, but we have been trying to think of a better solution and we didn't find. So also we have some tasks that we know that the incentives are not that important. For instance, time preference task, uh, we have some results now that uh, because we are evaluating this in order to, if we are able to reduce the, the incentive uh, in some in some measure, it will be great, no? And then in time preference, for instance, we have found that there's no any difference between pain and not pain, but in social preference, for sure they are. So mm, hypothetical payoffs that do not work in social behavior. So yeah. What what seems to be clear is that you know money or in this case incentives are absolutely required to to decrease social desirable responses in order to get more effective or more efficient uh, data or, or, or no no more efficient data you know to 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 get high quality data to 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 make decisions no um uh another question what is the cost per employee and what are the turnaround times well um, the assessment itself uh normally is uh, about so the prices are about between 50 uh, or the stakes about between 50 and 100 euro and we typically pay one out of 10. So the expected payoff, uh, so the winner gets between 50 and 100. So those ones who are selected uh, for, for payment. And, but since there are nine out of 10 who are not selected, the, uh, the average is reduced to between five and 10 euro per person. In the uh, express uh, assessment, we can measure all all the all the portfolio of the reduced measures of the five dimensions in 15 20 minutes um, in, in the pro uh, version that includes everything we are about 40 minutes let's go with monica uh, monica capra some organizations need to make decisions quickly of course is there a way to do a b testing etc fast perhaps using apps very good question um probably i'm not the best i'm well i'm an, not an expert probably this was a question for erica yesterday but um yeah but the problem is sometimes that we know that some interventions work in the short run but not in the long run so you should measure it recursively and um, but i guess so you can use smartphone apps for for doing a b testing um not sure right now for in which cases but for instance for for product packaging for for but for employee sites it is more complicated but it's a it's a good question and, and this is something i will think about because it can help a lot. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much uh, for, for the question. Brilliant. Let's go with the last by uh, Ajis. Antonio, please clarify the followings. Is the assessment taking place based on the predefined preferences like long run and cooperativeness? Well, I'm not sure I understand the, the question, but um, basically, what we, uh, I'm not sure if you're talking about the, the last example, but probably this was the case. No, we measured a lot of things and then we put all of them in the cocktail. We uh, didn't have any expectation. Well, we have some expectation, but we, the, the survey to the leaders was after our, uh, our analysis. So uh, we didn't know what they thought. And casually, because I didn't mention it, but or I didn't recall it, but remember that 
the HR leaders were not so mistaken. They they focus on long run orientation and cooperativeness, and these were the two variables that worked. Uh, well, so but no, well, we measured a lot of, uh, of a lot of measures without any expectation, so exploratory. Yes, in, in this case, it's important to 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 point out that uh, that uh, one thing is what people or HR leaders or managers think about who, which is important, and and the other is effectively measuring that and, and demonstrate that those two variables or or whatever are predicting or maximizing uh, group KPI performance. Antonio. A pleasure, as always. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh